Hello and welcome to today's Object Talk, which is in partnership with Bevis Mark Synagogue. As part of our partnership with the Synagogue, we will be releasing Object Talks throughout the year to showcase objects linked to Bevis Marks, both from their collection and from the Jewish Museum London's collection. Bevis Mark Synagogue was built in 1701 as one of the first synagogues to be built in England after the Jewish resettlement in 1656. It is the oldest synagogue still in use in the United Kingdom and the oldest synagogue in continuous use in Europe. Bevis Marks is an important part of the Spanish and Portuguese community's heritage and its collection and archive tells the story of this community in Britain. Our partnership will endeavour to bring this story to life through a special series of object talks in partnership with the community. Today, we will be hearing from Rachel Kolsky, an award-winning tour guide, author, and founder of Go London Tours, who will be talking about Bevis Mark Synagogue and its neighbours, looking at the context of its location and proximity to other synagogues when thinking about the history of Bevis Mark. I will now hand over to Rachel Kolsky. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. My name is Rachel Kolsky, and I'm one of a series of people that uh, the Jewish Museum of Bevis Marks has um, asked to prepare some short introductory videos or zooms as we now call them um, into different aspects of uh, Bevis Mark Synagogue, which is undergoing um, a very high profile lottery heritage uh, project at the moment, uh, sort of with renovations and uh, sort of um, sort of adding in educational areas and things like that. So it's very, very exciting, very, very exciting times. So my role for you is to put Bevis Marks into a little bit of context. Um, some of you might have met me before, either um, on the streets where I lead walking tours or maybe even through Zooms, which I've been doing obviously for the last couple of years during the, uh, during the pandemic. And um, you'll know that my tagline as a guide and also really as an author is the human stories behind the buildings. And um, whenever I do do a tour or a Zoom, I always think, you know, nothing exists in isolation. Um, everything exists there's some kind of context, you know, with this existence, whether there's, you know, history or surrounding buildings or people um, associated with, with the building. And, um, and really my work in the past is a, I'm a librarian by profession, a research, research librarian in the financial services world. And then I became a guide and an author. And uh, I, probably the most important book I've written uh, pertaining to this type of uh, story is I'm the author of Jewish London, which I'm very proud to say has now gone to third edition. So uh, Bevis Marks and its neighbours. Uh, Bevis Marks, uh, and you can see a photograph of Bevis Marks exterior over to the uh, left hand side, is um, one of the most important synagogues in Britain today. It's the longest established synagogue that's still open um, over 300 years of continuous um, uh, work, uh, services. And um, the image over to the right hand side is a synagogue known as the Great Synagogue of Duke's Place, which doesn't exist anymore, but actually was literally a couple of hundred yards um, away. So, um, and you know, really, as I've been explaining, it's really quite amazing how two synagogues can exist side by side for so many years. Um, one gets obliterated during the Blitz of the Second World War, and one remains almost totally un unscathed. Anyway, Bevis Marks and its neighbours, well, let's go back in time and give you a little bit of context to the stories that I'm going to tell. So firstly, here are some um, signs that you will see in the City of London today. The City of London is what was originally London. It's now uh, London's financial centre, or one of London's two financial centres, if you count the Docklands as a financial centre as well. And um, historians tend to agree that Jewish people arrived in England um, at the time of King William I, also known as uh, William the Conqueror. He invaded England in 1066 and found very swiftly that there was no real system of credit, what we would call banking. Christians could lend money, but they weren't able to charge interest on it. So I guess most of them didn't do that. And so William uh, invited Jewish people over from Northern France to England. Uh, most of them went to London, certainly in the first instance, and many of them acted as money lenders. Not all of them. Many of them had far more modest uh, backgrounds than money lending. And um, 
bear in mind that there were never any ghettos in Britain. Um, so Jewish community lived side by side with the non-Jewish community. And the Jewish community was very much protected by the monarch through his envoys and then the sheriffs. And um, they were allowed everything they needed. So there was the cemetery, they could have um, a bet din, a court of law, there were mikvah ot, the ritual bars, there were Jewish schools, and there were also Jewish communities dotted around the country as well in county capitals such as Lincoln, York, uh, Norwich, Oxford. Um, and for a time, the Jewish community was very well protected. It became quite um, successful. And of course, the more money you make, the more tax the government stroke monarchs would get as, as well. Um, but to cut a very long story short, um, discrimination began to set in. Uh, there was envy of Jewish people that made a little bit of, little bit of money. And um, gradually, synagogues got closed down. Um, Jewish people were accused of crimes they patently hadn't, hadn't committed. Jewish people were imprisoned in the Tower of London, and sadly, there were, they were ex executions. Um, and um, also in the city of London, I should say, as well as the street signs, um, you can actually find churches that are named for the Jewish community. So this is the Church of St. Lawrence Jury, because it was right where the Jewish community was uh, situated. And this is the tower of the Church of St. Olaf Jury, um, not, so, not so far away. So if you go to the city of London today, the Jewish community isn't there anymore, but you certainly do have these reminders of what, what was there. The Great Synagogue stood near this site until 1272, and that's a reminder of those synagogues being taken over, often being taken over by um, uh, Christian groups, you know, for places of Christian Christian worship. Um, in 2001, a mikvah was discovered uh, in the uh, in the, what was the Jewish area of the city of London, and this was really really exciting, an amazing find, and it's been magnificently reconstructed at the Jewish Museum. So if you visit the Jewish Museum and you go into the main, uh, just through the main foyer and go through uh, towards the back here, uh, you 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 will see it, um, really mag magnificently done. However, as time went on uh, in uh, medieval Jewry, things got very, very difficult. The text on the right hand side is part of the statute of Judaismo Jude that was issued in 1275. And in the top left hand corner, you can see a depiction of Jewish people being um, hit and beaten. Now, one of the things in the statute said that Jewish people over a certain age had to wear a badge. And you can see the badge on those Jewish men. It looks like the two tablets, two tablets of stone. They were also in 1275 not allowed uh, anymore to practice uh, money lending. They could become farmers and merchants, but actually you can't become a farmer overnight. It's not that, it's not that simple. So things became very, very difficult for, for the Jewish uh, community. Um, as I mentioned, many of them were imprisoned in the Tower of London, many of them were executed, and actually in 1290, King Edward I finally expelled the Jews from England. And so that really ends the first period of anglo jewry So following the expulsion of 1290, there was the uh, period known as the expulsion, where officially there were no Jewish people in England. That's another story in, in, in its own right. And um, we had to wait in England till 12, um, to 12, till 1656. And we didn't have a monarch on the throne at all. We had Oliver Cromwell running the country. And Oliver Cromwell then invited the Jews back into England. And that's known as the resettlement. Now, this um, photograph is uh, uh, Creed Church Lane, right towards the eastern end of the city of London, near Aldgate. And there are two very important things to remember about the resettlement when Oliver Cromwell allowed Jews back in. One, the first Jews to return to England were Spanish and Portuguese Jews. They actually came from Holland because that's where they had gone when they'd been expelled from uh, Spain and Portugal. The other important thing to remember is that they did not go and try and reinvent the Jewish community uh, that was in the centre of the city of London um, and in and around Cheapside where those two churches were that I showed you before. They established their new Jewish community on the eastern side of the city near Aldgate. Now this photograph uh, with the arrow is pointing to a plaque that tells you the site of the first synagogue of the resettlement. And so 
like any new community, they don't have purpose-built synagogues straight away. And in fact, the first thing that any new Jewish community would always establish would be a cemetery and the mikvah. A synagogue always comes later because you don't need a synagogue to pray. You only need to have um, 10 men um, uh, for what's known as a minion. And also you need to know the direction of Jerusalem. And as long as you've got those two things, you can uh, run your services wherever, wherever you like. However, as communities grow, they typically then want somewhere a little bit um, bigger, you know, with more rooms, with room for schools and, and um, social events and, and things like that. Anyway, this was the site of the first synagogue after the, after the settlement. And this was the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. And in fact, obviously not on this building, but it's, um, it's been well documented, that building. And in fact, Samuel Pepys, our very famous um, London uh, diarist of the 17th century, he put in his diary on the 14th of October, 1663. I'm going to read to you what he wrote. Thence home and after dinner, my wife and I to the Jewish synagogue, the one that was on this site. Their service all in a singing way and in Hebrew, but Lord, to see the disorder, the laughing, the sporting, and no attention, but confusion in all their service, more like brutes than people knowing the true God. And indeed, I never did see so much or could have imagined that there had been any religion in the whole world so absurdly performed as this. And uh, the date was the 14th of October, 1663. And uh, he was obviously visiting on a Jewish festival called Simchat Torah, where there's a lot of uh, joyous uh, rejoicing and uh, gentlemen often have something to drink and there's dancing. But of course, he wouldn't have been expecting that um, at all. Anyway, you can see it says there's 1657 to 1701. By 1701, the um, Spanish and Portuguese community needed somewhere just that little bit bigger and they needed something purpose built. And so literally around the corner, they built this synagogue, the absolutely magnificent Bevis Marks. Um, it is the most important synagogue in Britain. It's uh, been um, providing uh, services um, since, well, since 1701, which is over 300 years. It's very, very interesting look and feel to the synagogue. Um, at first glance, it looks a bit like a giant chapel. It was designed by a Quaker, Joseph Avis, and obviously Quakers don't have any ostentation in their buildings whatsoever. But it's also a little bit like a Christopher Wren church in some ways, quite plain outside. And when it was built in 1700, 1701, uh, the city of London was still being rebuilt after the Great Fire of 1666, and Christopher Wren was the architect in charge of that, of that project, so it sort of makes sense. The big windows, plain glass, obviously, to let lots of daylight in, and this was very much a Christopher Wren motif as well. Um, something else to bear in mind is that Oliver Cromwell allowed Jewish people, the Jewish community, to have two places of worship, but they had to be discreet. And what you actually can't tell from this image is that actually it was in a gated compound. Um, um, so it was a little bit off the road and it's still like that today. So there are many people that walk past the synagogue and don't even notice it's there because there's walls and there's a gate and, you know, people are on their phone and they don't even notice uh, what, um, what, they're, what they're walking by. The, um, the truly magnificent element of uh, Bevis Mark Synagogue is that uh, when you go inside, it's, it, it's totally different. It's absolutely stunning. Um, it's actually a miniature version of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. If anybody's uh, been to Amsterdam, been to the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, you'll recognize it immediately. But this is a much smaller, cozier version, um, I think. Um, you've got uh, the, the ark, which looks a little bit like a reredos uh, from a church. You've got seven absolutely huge brass chandeliers, um, six big ones and one giant one, the giant one representing the Shabbat and the other six representing the days of the week, the, um, the big giant one, of, um, a gift actually from the Amsterdam community. You've got 10 giant brass candlesticks representing the Ten Commandments and you've got 12 pillars. They look like marble, but actually they're wood painted as marble representing um, the 12 tribes. Some people say maybe the 12 disciples as well, a little bit of mixture of the two, of the two. Uh, religions, um, the, uh, the, the wooden pews and the reader's desk there in the middle. Um, 
what's absolutely amazing about uh, Bevis Marx is that if anybody from those 1700s could return to London today, they would go into Bevis Marx and it would look almost exactly the same. Probably the only little things that have changed is that there's now electricity and a little bit of maybe um, uh, maybe where woodwork, uh, woodwork got a little bit of woodworm and they've had to do a little bit of renovation there. But some of those, um, they've actually got some pews in Bebis Marks that date from the previous uh, synagogue. Um, and the pews that you see here are 300 years old. The sense of history is absolutely um, immense. So, excuse me. Um, there are two really famous uh, families linked to uh, Bevis Marx. One is the de Israeli family, um, uh, Mr. De Israeli, as it is Israeli in the top left hand corner. His son was Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, Benjamin Disraeli took away the apostrophe. And uh, Benjamin Disraeli is famous for being the first Jewish born prime minister, the first and only Jewish born prime minister here in Britain. Um, Disraeli is a story in his own right. To me, he's my darling Dizzy, and I've given talks about Disraeli all around the world and um, via, via ships and Zoom. And uh, he's an absolutely fascinating personality, but it was actually um, a sort of a rift that his father had with Bevis Smart Synagogue um, when Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli was only 12 and a half years old, which led to Benjamin Disraeli being uh, baptized as a Christian, as a child, which meant that he could actually then pursue his um, parliamentary ambitions. But as I said, that's a separate story. But I think when you when you visit Bevis Marks, it is one of the most um, important stories to, to, to hear. And Disraeli is so important to British history. He has plaques all over uh, London. The other very important family linked to Bevis Marks is Moses Montefiore. You can't overestimate uh, how important Moses Montefiore was to the Jewish community. He lived to be over 100 years old. Um, he he um, was leader for decades of the Board of Deputies. He um, was sheriff of the city of, of London, uh, never wanted to become Lord Mayor and never wanted to become um, a member a member of Parliament. Um, he devoted uh, his, his life really to diplomacy, for um, supporting Jewish communities around the world. He was almost like, you know, like a quasi-diplomat. Quasi and he always wanted Jewish people to be immensely proud of being both Jewish and being British, be proud of being, be proud of, of living in England. He lived in Mayfair and there's a blue plaque there on his house at 99 Park Lane. And interestingly enough, uh, Benjamin Disraeli lived at 93 Park Lane. So for a time they, they were, they were neighbours with just a couple of houses in between. And when he lived to be over 100, uh, Moses Montefiore was used by a um, a smoke, a cigarette company, a tobacco company, to say you might not live as long as Moses Montefiore, but you'll live a long, a long life if you do smoke Alan and Gunter's uh, cigarettes and, and tobacco. So fascinating, fascinating gentleman. And Bevis Marx was his, was his synagogue. Now, by the mid to late 19th century, um, a number of members of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, and I should say that Israelis were of Italian descent and often uh, we just we talk about the community being Sephardi, meaning you know sort of south um, uh, southern European, I, I suppose, and from from North Africa. And um, by the mid um, mid to late nineteenth century, a lot of the Sephardi, straight Spanish and Portuguese community, were moving away from that sort of eastern edge of the city of London, on the edge of what became the East End, and they were moving westwards uh, to an area known as Maida Vale, and. Um, in 1896, this synagogue was opened. It's in Lauderdale Road. You can see the name of the street in the bottom left-hand corner. And when this synagogue opened for the Spanish and Portuguese community, there was talk of uh, um, demolishing Bevis Mark synagogue. I mean, absolutely shock horror. But fortunately, some people realized that actually there were sufficient people left in that area um, to warrant the, um, the continuation of Bevis Marks within within the city of London. And, um, and so the two, the two synagogues um, have, have remained open through, through the centuries. Uh, Lauderdale Road is the flagship, um, and the flagship synagogue of the Spanish, Spanish Portuguese community today. 
and uh, is where the head offices of the uh, Spanish and Portuguese community are. There are a number of other Spanish Portuguese uh, synagogues uh, around London, at Holland Park and, and in Wembley. And uh, today, Spanish Portuguese community or stroke Sephardi represent around three and a half percent of Anglo of Anglo jury. There was also an orphanage um, opened at the same time, and that uh, orphanage linked to the synagogue, and that remained open until around 1940. So, what about Bevis Marks and its neighbours? Because the Spanish and Portuguese community came over, and they were followed quite swiftly by the Ashkenazi Jewish community, the Ashkenazi Jewish community emanating from northern northern Europe. And there was a very short period of time in Anglo Jewry where the Spanish Portuguese community was larger than the Ashkenazi community, uh, both in number and aggregate wealth. But relatively quickly, the Ashkenazi community grew and grew, and um, it became and has remained the dominant community here in in Britain. So. Where did they, where did they worship? Well, the first community that opened, opened literally 100 yards or so away from Bevis Marks in Duke's Place. Duke's Place by the early 1700s, <coughs> excuse me, was very, very Jewish. That little area around Bevis Marks and Duke's, and Duke's Place Synagogue um, was around 25% Jewish by um, 1711 or so. And um, <coughs> the first um, synagogue was Purpose Belt Synagogue was opened around 1720 and then <coughs> uh, they uh, rebuilt it in 1790 and then there was a new building in the 1800s and constantly remodeled um, also behind gates. <coughs> this is what the um, main Duke's Place Synagogue looked like. <coughs> what was became known as what was became known as a uh, cathedral synagogue and you can see you've got these three layers of um, plain glass windows big and soaring and really emulating large um, Christian places of worship. And the great synagogue of Duke's place was the flagship synagogue, but it was the first one, of course, but it was a flagship one. And this is where all the great and the good would, um, would worship. So you were thinking about um, the Samuels family, the Rothschilds, they would all be worshiping here at, um, at, Duke's, at Duke's place. And um, in 1809, um, absolutely amazingly, three sons of King George III, the Dukes of Cumberland, Cambridge and Suffolk, went to a Friday night service at that synagogue as guests of the Goldschmidt family. And this is a very, uh, sort of, I suppose you could say, unpleasant caricature of that visit. You can see that the Dukes there are representing the, the goods that were famous from their areas, lead and butter and cheese. And you can see there the obsequious Jewish community welcoming them, but also very, very uh, much a caricature of Jewish people at that time. You can see the gentlemen with their long beards and their long hooked noses. It's not a pleasant um, caricature at all. But the the fact that these dukes actually went to the synagogue at that time is very, very important when you think about the, the Jewish community gaining some acceptance within society. There might have still been civic disabilities. They couldn't become members of parliament then. They couldn't become lords. They couldn't be um, lord mayors. But um, society was gradually actually um, accepting them more and more, even up to the realms of royalty. The synagogue, sadly, was bombed during the um, Blitz of the Second World War. And do remember how arbitrary the Blitz was. This is um, a picture of the bombed out synagogue. And literally 100 yards or so down the road, Bevis Marks remained almost totally unscathed. And I think the, this can never be underestimated, um, the arbitrariness of the Blitz of the, of the Second World War. And um, there was talk, this is a service here, saying that after the war we will rebuild, uh, but actually that, that never happened. By the end of the war, the Jewish community in that area was really, really depleted, and they certainly wouldn't have been able to warrant such a large synagogue being rebuilt. Um, on the site of the synagogue was built an, an office block post Second World War, and then that block in turn has been um, demolished and now there's a brand new block, um, uh, office block built on the site, but there is a plaque there. So if anybody goes and visits Bevis Mark Synagogue, do please also go and visit this plaque as well. Uh, and that, that way you will really understand the proximity of those two, of those two, two synagogues for so, for so many years. Well, this was the first Ashkenazi synagogue to um, be established after the settlement. And a couple of other synagogues followed them because um, 
you often get disagreements within um, communities. And indeed, there was a disagreement at the Great Synagogue of Duke's Place, or a broikus, if you if you prefer. And um, it was a gentleman, who, the gentleman who got um, annoyed and angry he was a chap called Marcus Hamburger. So he did what anybody would do. He went off and he opened up a private synagogue in his own home. And uh, that synagogue was on Fenchurch Street, um, not far from what is now Fen where Fenchurch Street Station is uh, today. And it was a private synagogue. And indeed, there are plenty of private synagogues uh, around in London uh, today. If people want to have a synagogue, a place of worship in their own home. As I said, uh, it's no nothing, nothing against that what whatsoever. And um, however, he then went off to Italy, good old Marcus Hamburger. And when he came back, he opened um, a public, a public synagogue. This isn't it. This is a later synagogue. His public synagogue um, was also um, in sort of the Fenchurch Street um, area, and it lasted until 1893 when um it was demolished and the new ham the new hambro synagogue opened in 1899 and this is a, um, a picture of it um and this was on a street called a union street and here's a photograph of what it looked like inside rather sort of dark and dank uh, to be to be quite honest and um a uh, Union Street actually now is called Adler Street. Historians debate after whom Adler Street is named. Some people say it's named after Jacob Adler, um, a Yiddish actor. Other people say it's named after the Adlers, um, Nathan and Herman Adler, who were father and son, uh, chief rabbis, um, the consecutive chief rabbis for, of, great, of Great Britain. But the irony of this synagogue, uh, the Hanbury Synagogue, is that there was the Bruegers, um, you know, so it was a breakaway from the Great Synagogue of Duke's Place. When the Great Synagogue of Duke's Place had been bombed um, after the Second World War and it didn't have a home, actually the members moved over to the Hambro, the Hambro Synagogue. So um, yes, a little, a little bit of irony there for the, for the, for the synagogues there uh, on the edge of the city of London. And uh, the third synagogue that was established nearby, and this is the third Ashkenazi synagogue. So these three synagogues, or Ashkenazi ones, um, was what became known as the New Synagogue. And that was opened in 1760 in the Bricklayer's Arms on uh, Leadenhall Street. And um, uh, basically there was a, um, a, a cellar underneath uh, storing wine. And there's this lovely little ditty that said, um, the spirits above are spirits divine, the spirits below are spirits of wine. Uh, anyway, so it was there for a few, a few years and then it moved to St. Helens, Great St. Helens. If anybody um, who knows London can't picture Great St. Helens, just picture where the gherkin is. Um, and um, and that's, that's where Great St. Helens was. And the synagogue there was opened in um, 18, 1838, um, a magnificent synagogue, so of enhanced and enlarged. And um, this is a picture of its interior. And it was here until the early 20th century, by which point the, uh, the land in the city was needed for commercial purposes, you know, for offices, you know, the city of London was very much the commercial financial center. And what was very interesting here is that the new synagogue uh, moved to Hackney. It moved to an area known as Stamford Hill and in 1915. And when the synagogue was built in Hackney in 1915, they basically made a replica of this, um, uh, this synagogue um, at Great St. Helens. And this is the synagogue. This is a photograph taken in the late 1970s. Absolutely magnificent. And it was on uh, Egerton Road, Stamford Hill. And uh, if you meet anybody whose family came from uh, Stamford Hill and this is where they prayed, where they davened, or where a boy might have had his bar mitzvah or a couple got married, um, everybody said they just got married at Egerton Road. Nobody ever said they went to the new synagogue. It was Egerton Road, named after the street on which it stood. Um, there's a, a lovely foundation stone there, which gives you the history in one place. You can see there the three dates, the 1760, the 1838 and the 1915. And um, in the 1980s, the synagogue um, building was taken over by the Bobber, the Hasidic sect. And so now it's very much a Hasidic, um, Hasidic uh, place, place of worship and, and place of schooling as well. And so that gives you the synagogues, these Bevis Marx, Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, and the three key early Ashkenazi synagogues, but not so far away from all of these synagogues is another synagogue that I think should be uh, also mentioned when I think of Bevis Marx and its neighbours, because if you go to 
the Jewish East End today. Um, of the synagogues that I've mentioned, only Bevis Marks remains in the area, but a very short walk away is this gem of a synagogue, Sandis Row. And it's worth remembering um, this synagogue because it was founded in 1854. And if you look at the mezuzah there, if you take a close look at it, it's made out of Delft pottery. And this is a reminder that the community that set up this synagogue were um, economic migrants from Holland. And um, they moved into this building in 1869, which already existed. It was built in 1766 as a French Huguenot chapel. And so this synagogue um, is a reminder of the Ashkenazi community not so far away from the Spanish and Portuguese community, got Bevis Marks, but it's also a reminder that the Jewish community in this area was just one of many, many different immigrant, immigrant groups. A different story, a different tour, a different presentation, but certainly that key element, people should always remember when you go and visit this area and explore that um, it's very, very layered with lots and lots of um, different immigrant groups over the years, but um, certainly um, to walk to, to go to Bevis Marks, visit Bevis Marks, and then walk that few minutes walk uh, to Sandis Row, um, actually you do get the best of both worlds. You get the Spanish and Portuguese story and you get the Ashkenazi story as well. Uh, that's what it looks like inside and um, absolutely beautiful. It's quite small, it's cosy. Um, the orange and cream links to the um, House of Orange, obviously, um, to, uh, Holland. And this synagogue actually uh, in 1887 became one of the founder members of the Federation of what was then the minor synagogues, now just known as the Federation. And to give you, the reason I want to tell you that is because this was the largest of the synagogues that founded the Federation. So you can imagine how small some of those other small um, Ashkenazi synagogues in the Jewish East End, East End were. Uh, Sandus Row, like Bevis Marks, is still an open synagogue, still runs uh, services and still has an active, an active membership. So long may both of them uh, can continue. And um, uh, I just want to end with a map. This is a very famous map of the Jewish East End. Um, from the very early 20th century. And the reason I want to end with this for you is that if you just look at that blue rectangle, the synagogues I've mentioned in this little presentation, whether it's uh, Bevis Marks, the Hambro, uh, Great Synagogue of Duke's Place, the New, and Sandis Row, they all would have been enclosed within that, um, that rectangle. And you can see then, these were the nascent shawls of the Jewish community post resettlement. And you can see that when the Russian and Polish Jews came into England in great numbers in the 1880s and beyond, how big the Jewish community uh, became. Where the map is very, very dark blue, it's very, very Jewish. Where it's dark red, it's Jewish. And where it's pale, it's not so Jewish. Uh, but it gives you an idea uh, very, very visually of how the Jewish East End grew and grew and went eastwards. But of course, that's a totally different uh, tour, as I said, another very different story. And I'm sure you'll hear it from somebody before too long. So there you have it, Bevis Marks and its neighbours. Lots, lots of things for you to explore when you come and visit the newly restored and reopened Bevis Marks. Please do go and venture, venture beyond and explore the Jewish East End as well. Thank you, everybody. Looking forward to seeing you on the streets, as they say, or indeed again on another on another Zoom. Bye for now.